and uh, welcome back after your coffee. I hope that uh, lifted you up after that very entertaining first panel. Uh, my name is Jonathan Russell. I'm the executive director of uh, the global division of Quilliam. We're a counter-extremism organization based in London. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all and with a, a very, very distinguished panel uh, to talk for the next 90 minutes or so uh, about how we can take some of these strategic communications approaches that we've talked about over the last day or so and think about how we tackle uh, the rising threat of uh, violent extremism through those strategic communications. Uh, we're going to be focusing on, on all sorts of extremism, uh, but most prominently, uh, we see at the moment a global jihadist insurgency uh, sweeping uh, across the world. We've seen the rise and rise of Islamism as a political movement, itself a spectrum with a, an ultra-violent fringe that, that captures all the headlines at the moment. But we've seen over the last 15 or more years uh, charismatic leaders from that uh, particular ideology and their lieutenants uh, communicating better than ever, and communicating, most importantly, better than the mainstream and the establishment that they are posing a challenge to. More than the groups who are doing this effectively, we're seeing recruiters and people at the, at the ground level communicating effectively, and learning to exploit those who have fallen through the nets of our societies, not necessarily to, to fixed groups, but in an amorphous way, posing security threats and challenges to, to pretty much every single one of our states and, crucially, to every single one of our societies as well. Those recruited are not just motivated to commit violence, though, of course, that's probably why we all care about it so much. They're also recruited in pyramid schemes, in, uh, in, in structures that resemble, resemble cults, that to proselytize to others and to, to ensure that this broader political movement continues to have recruits. And we should be interested, too, about how those structures operate and how those people uh, are swept up, because very often those, too, are motivated to violence eventually. And in large numbers, most prominently over the last three or four years, thousands uh, from dozens of countries across the world have been motivated by this, these same communications techniques and by these same ideologies in their thousands to go and join uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria uh, and to travel as foreign terrorist fighters. In short, communications are being used to devastating effect. And it's not just changing attitudes, it's very tangibly changing their behaviors too. Now, the, the panel here will, will talk uh, some about that Islamist narrative, some about the narratives of other extremist groups who uh, have learned to use communications in the same way as that broader political movement. And I think they'll also talk about the ideology, most prominently the Salafi jihadi ideology that underpins some of these narratives, and crucially, how that ideology not only reinforces the narrative and the black and white worldview that groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda set out, but also how it motivates people not just to a political movement, but towards violence as well. And interestingly for me, how those narratives and that ideology in particular, to a certain extent, hampers our ability to do anything about it. Uh, and more of that later on. Comparably, we seem to have come to communications to tackle and prevent violent extremism very late in the day. There has been an unease about confronting the ideology head on. There seems to have been a lack of direction to a certain extent in coordinating our communications approach to violent extremism. And it hasn't necessarily always been coordinated with deeper efforts to prevent and counter violent extremism through education, through development, through law and order, and through counterterrorism. But it is undeniably crucial. And here today, uh, we have four experts, four outstanding speakers, who uh, are going to talk a little bit about their approaches uh, over the last decade and more uh, in this space. Um, starting to my left, before I introduce them properly um, and, uh, and encourage them to, to give their presentations, just quickly, we have Professor Hassan Abbas from the National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs. Uh, next, further left, we have Dr. Anne Speckhardt, 
uh, from her own uh, International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. We have His, His Excellency Maksud Cruz uh, from Hadaya. And at the end, we have uh, Dr. Kaspar uh, Rikovic uh, from Globsec. Uh, I'm going to turn over now, but I would encourage you first to, to tweet throughout this, this presentation. If we're talking about communication, strategic communications, let's win the battle of the airwaves as well. Uh, please use the requisite hashtag, uh, Riga Stratcom. And uh, if you can save up your questions, because after the, the presentations from these four panelists, uh, we will have, I hope, about half an hour for your questions afterwards, and I'll do my best uh, to, to get those in. If you fear you're unable to have a platform to, to speak, please tweet them in, uh, because I trust that I'll be able to gather the questions up and uh, make sure that we have them answered for you as well. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will pass over to Professor Hassan Abbas, who, um, has, uh, you can read about him in your, in your book, uh, in your booklet uh, there as well. But um, I just note something that's not written there. He wrote an excellent book. I, I, I always love giving, giving audiences a reading recommendation. The Taliban Revival, um, I think it came out in 2014. Sure. An excellent uh, proceed of the roots and the current complexities of the Pakistan-Afghanistan frontier. A must read if, if you're interested in that region, and you should be. Professor, please. Thank you so much for that very uh, kind introduction. It, it is truly a um, great pleasure and honor to be here, and I really appreciate the um, organizers for picking this venue. To be in a library, there couldn't have been anything more inspiring. So thank you very much, organizers. Uh, the task before me, um, in the 12 minutes that I'm given, uh, which as a professor for me is very strange, uh, strange because I'm used to stand and speak for an hour. So I'll focus in, on my 12 minutes, but um, the plan is that I will talk about the challenge of countering violent extremism through a counter-narrative perspective in Muslim societies, in Muslim society, societies across the world. And for that, I have based on my field research, and my field research is I'm actually coming here right from, from Turkey, and previously uh, about a dozen trips to Iraq, and originally, as a disclaimer, I'm an uh, American of Pakistani uh, roots. Um, and my, just for you to have an understanding of my perspective, I'm a former police chief uh, and now an academic. So I claim to have something from academia and something as a practitioner. So I will talk about five practical ways to effectively communicate the counter-narrative message. However, to do that, um, and the way we have framed the the title of this panel, communicating this message, by no means at all we are claiming, or at least I'm not claiming, and I know my very wise and experienced colleagues are also not claiming, that we uh, really and fully comprehend the extremist narrative. First, how can you have a counter-narrative without understanding the narrative of extremists? Secondly, we are not claiming that we already have built a counter-narrative. And all that needs to be done now is to just deliver it. Now, first you have to understand the narrative, then craft the narrative, and then deliver it. So, in 12 minutes, I would like to take you through that journey. Um, and I'll pose three questions first, which I think are central to answer this. Then, I will, in one-liners, I'll mention what I think is the extremist narrative, the five principles, and then I'll come to my five strategies. Hopefully, I'll be able to do that in 12 minutes. Wish me best of luck. The first question, which have you been asked, I was asked yesterday by Austrian Radio, and, and I owe it to uh, the professor sitting next to me to, to help me frame it. Is it that we have pushed out Daesh from Mosul, and I was close to Mosul a few weeks ago, that, that clearing of Mosul and Raqqa means that we have we have won, and that this extremist narrative is defeated? I earnestly tell you, I, I wish I could have said that. The physical elimination or the pushing out of Daesh or other extremists from their sanctuaries or their spaces that they have assumed through brutality, through human rights violations, through cruel behavior, that's just one part. There's something more to it. So this countering because we know this was the Taliban narrative which feeded, 
which fed into the Al-Qaeda narrative. From Al-Qaeda narrative, it was taken by the Zarqawi network. From Zarqawi, it went into Daesh. So we don't know what the next stage is. Yes, I'm not trying to underestimate or undermine the success. I think it was a phenomenal coordination between Iraqi military, between some good parts of the, the, what we call Shia militias. There, there are some who have done well, there are others who have more problematic, but then, fully supported by United States and people on the ground as advisors and, and supporters. I'm not trying to take away that credit. I'm saying is, it's a long battle, and this the, leads to my next question. Is it this extremist narrative, is this something new? Is it last 60 years, 40 years? I would say no. This extremist narrative is not new to Muslims. And I'll quote you three one-liner quotations. The Prophet of Islam, as I say, peace be upon him, Muhammad, he said very categorically, he's in his quote, a one-liner, the ink of a scholar's pen is more sacred than the blood of a martyr. I think he knew something which we don't know because he was emphasizing something, the pen over blood. In Konya, and I'm just coming 24 hours ago, I have Konya where Mawlana Room, uh, one of the most phenomenal mystical uh, leaders of Islam who's buried there. Um, and it's, it's not somebody who was ordinary or not powerful or, 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 or who was um, somewhat isolated. No, he was mainstream. Go to any bookstore. I didn't get a chance to go to any bookstore here in Latvia, which are in Riga, I'll go. But anywhere I go in the world, I find his books. His theory, he used to say, if you have to treat illness, whether it is spiritual illness or it is physical illness, the only treatment that we know of is through love and affection and passion in terms of compassion and empathy. They, he knew something. He was marketing this in a, in a modern, I'm using modern terminology, seven, eight hundred years ago, he knew something. Or Ali, uh, Ali the most phenomenal Muslim warrior, uh, the fourth caliph of Islam, he used to say, and this is to me a counter narrative, and we are not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's something in there. These personalities were saying these things because they knew of something right from the early days of Islam. The Ali had said, your hatred or animosity towards your enemy, your hatred or animosity towards your enemy should not force you to be unjust. So what I'm saying is, this was my second question. Is this extremism challenge new? No, it's not new. There were people who, who could see this and they were saying this. The third question that I pose is whether, and this, this is, I owe it to the third speaker in the list, which, which we were talk, having a conversation before this, and how to measure the effectiveness of this. And this is extremely difficult because maybe the Hidayah and other organizations and the professor and everyone else will do a phenomenal job. They'll frame and craft a wonderful message. And then there is this new form of radicalization or new terrorist attack, which is, linked to radicalization, and you'll say, okay, we have failed. Well, how many people you are treating, because it's, and that the answer to this third question is, you cannot measure the effectiveness of something which is, parts of it are historically rooted. The historical narrative and understanding is very deep. And if I may ask you, I know there are so many practitioners here and military officers, um, and I salute all those who are wearing uniform, whether military or police, uh, for all that you do for our uh, countries. Uh, and I know there are many political scientists. If I may quickly ask you, if you raise your hand, if you are a historian, how many historians we have? One, two, three, four, five. I'm glad. Um, I wish there were more. Uh, because to understand this issue, this, which is historically rooted, you have to look at that historically. So that's my introduction. I've taken quite a significant bit of time in that. Um, just five liners of what, what are the principles of what is um, the extremist narrative. First and foremost, and everywhere, this is from Pakistan and Afghanistan to Iraq and to Malaysia, extremists believe that Islam versus West battle is going on, and they think Islam is under threat. Second, Second feature or theme that I saw, this feeling of powerlessness and an urge to dominate global order. And this, this comes from the historical narrative. When you're constantly told, once upon a time you were ruling, these were the empires, you, this, this whole historical memory is framed in a way that pushes you to do something. Third, there are many conversations and there are many factors from socio-political and economic side which are having a deep impact on Muslim identity today. 
but that is all very quickly converted into a religious discourse. And we try to counter it from religious discourse without realizing, oh, the debate underneath this issue is very, very political. The fourth point, this exclusivity and rigidity that we see in terms of sectarianism, which is so deep-rooted, unfortunately. And it is not, we often think sectarianism, it means Shia versus Sunni, no. Um, th this is much deeper, there are so many different groups um, within even these traditions. And this is linked to, at times, Saudi Arabia versus Iran, which might be, I was asking recently, I teach students from all over the Muslim world at National Defense University, and I asked this to my um, student from Middle East, um, is this sectarian, is it Saudi Arabia versus Iran, is sectarian, is it political, is it economic? And there were three or four students from the region, all practitioners, they all said in, almost in one voice, oh, it's political, it's vested interests, it's, it's not necessarily sectarian. And last but not the least, we must admit we are in the age of small wars, nationalistic, ethnic, within the Muslim world. This disruption is creating these issues. So this brings me to my final three minutes, where I'll tell you how to then, what are the five principles of what, how will you communicate in, the, in this setting? First, it is the credibility of the messenger. And be clear, authoritarian states, which are at times our partners, may not be in the most effective fashion. You may have the best message. You may have the most well-worded message through the best platform, Twitter, Facebook, name anything. I think it, it is the credibility of the messenger. And something good is happening in that regard. I'll just mention three words which I want you to later on search for. Amman message in Jordan, where they brought all the Salafis, Sunnis, Shias, even Sufis, and they said, these are the three principles of counter-narrative. And those were against takfir, I'll just mention one, which is this, this tendency within Islam of calling the other as out of the pale of Islam. Then there was this uh, Marrakesh uh, uh, declaration in, in Morocco, where they mentioned the historical roots of how Muslims historically treated their minorities. Great lessons. Um, and within the, this first context, I would say rather than focusing on the centers or capitals of the big Muslim countries, which are important, important, you have to engage, you'll have to focus on Al-Azhar University. You'll have to focus on the Najaf Seminary. You'll have to focus, maybe Qum. Um, you'll have to focus on institutions like Hidayah and others, uh, like Quilim. Institutions don't go to state. It's the credibility of the individual and organization which is at stake. Second point, what is the second principle, how you'll go about it, is about Targeting slogans is important. Targeting buzzwords is important. But it is so important to understand the, of the historical narrative. Mullah Omar, and I am in my last minute or so, Mullah Omar, the leader, in Taliban, of leader of Taliban who had created issues, he got a lot of credibility because he said, I'm Amirul Mominin, which is a historically rooted word. Baghdadi got credibility, he said, I'm the Caliph. So we have to hit at those issues which comes out from the historical um, context. Last three points, one-liners, I promise, art and culture. And I, I heard something wonderful yesterday on this. The Sufi shrines, for instance, the mystical shrines across South Asia and Morocco and Algeria and you name a country, please, if you get a chance, go there or, or to Konya and you'll see the dancing dervishes. Uh, and they're not in minority. They already have the counter-narrative. It is just that they somehow are not our partners in counter-narrative messaging. The second last point, as I'd mentioned in my earlier assessment, frame these issues in political sense as well. People get inspired to commit violence because of at times political issues. Whereas we always think of Islam, whether the Muslims are creating most of the problems. There's no denying the fact. Last but not the least is the need for interfaith dialogue. I had mentioned to you they're long-term things and one anecdote and I'll leave you. Um, I was talking to my students in a CV class that I taught last year, and I mentioned to them, I watched this Iranian documentary on Maryam, Mary. And my student said so, and I was telling him that 13 episodes was outstanding. And he said, so why are you you're interested in Christianity? I said, no, without understanding Mary or Maryam, my own understanding of Islam cannot be completed. And he was stunned, and I was also surprised. The commonalities, the common ground in interfaith dialogue, because that's the best way to develop that trust. If you not have that trust between Christians, Jews, and Muslims, 
you'll not be able to treat or get a craft, a message. So a Muslim re imam has to talk to the rabbi and the, and the priest and the other way around. Thank you very much for your patience and it's great to have this opportunity. Thank you very much. Professor Abbas, thank, thank you very much. Uh, just to pick up on, on one of your points, I, I, I absolutely agree that the, it's a very potent mix, that, that mix between exclusivity, the, the takfiri approach to excommunicating others that, that don't agree with you, and, and the literalism and the, the rigidity of, uh, of taking a very, very narrow interpretation of, of your faith. And, and when you combine that with, um, you know, al-wala al, al al-bara, the, the, the ability to, to, to be violent, I suppose, towards those that don't fall into your in-group, it's a, it's a, it's a potent, potent mix. Uh, and I think also when you, when you combine that with the, the victimhood, the powerlessness that you said, and the, this nostalgia, this, this almost essence to make Islam great again, to coin a phrase, um, is, uh, is, is, is very dangerous, isn't it? Um, but uh, no, thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the questions for you, Professor. You, and next up, we've got Dr. Uh, Dr. Anne Speckhardt. Um, as I said at the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism, the fact that her new center takes a digital communications approach to violent extremism should make each and every one of us sit up and take notice. Largely because Anne has been working at this for, for decades and, and takes a, a, a psychology approach to it, a psychiatry approach to it, counterterrorism. She's worked for every single acronym you can think of, I think, uh, <laughs> over, over her long career, uh, home and, and away, and, and has written seven books in the, in the meantime. So, so the fact that she takes communication seriously as a solution to this, I think, should make us, make us all sit up. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you've got to say. Okay, great. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you for this invitation. It's uh, such a beautiful place we're in, and it's great to be in Riga again. It's been a while since I was here. And uh, as far as my background, I'm a psychologist. I work in a psychiatry department, and I head the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. We're a small think tank. But over my career, I've had the dubious uh, privilege of interviewing over 500 terrorists. And um, w when I'm interviewing them, I'm always looking for what put them on the terrorist trajectory and could it have been prevented? And is there something we could do to take them back off of it? So since I've been around for so long, I uh, consulted to UK Prevent and I also was asked by my own uh, government, the um, US Department of Defense to come to Iraq 2006-2007 and put together the detainee rehabilitation program, the Islamic challenge and uh, psychological rehabilitation of our 20,000 detainees, 800 juveniles. Uh, we hoped that um, we would be able to stop what was then Zarqawi's Al-Qaeda, as Hassan told us, and now we're seeing it again. And uh, from all my interviews of terrorists, I would say there's four things that make a terrorist, and that's a group, and uh, today the group of interest is ISIS, although, you know, of course, not the only terrorist group in the world, an ideology, which is always wrong. The ideology always argues for this cause, uh, we can do things that jump over normal moral barriers. So if it's an abortion clinic terrorist, uh, uh, abortionists, according to their ideology, uh, murder babies. So you can take a gun and stand outside a clinic and kill an abortion doctor. In the case of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Islam is under attack, Muslim people, Muslim lands are under attack, so you can attack, counterattack in a defensive jihad, uh, innocent civilians. So there's a group, an ideology, there's social support. It used to be you had to find a terrorist group, join a cell, and that was difficult. You, you waited before you went off to Pakistan and uh, joined Al-Qaeda, and uh, they vetted you and decided whether you can get in. Nowadays, all you need is your phone and you have social support. You can communicate by Skype, WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, Twitter, all the rest of them uh, with guys that are in Syria. You can be part of a cell just because you have a phone. So there's the group, the ideology, social support, and then however these things interact with your own individual vulnerabilities. So if you're in a conflict zone, it's really revenge and trauma-driven. 
if you're in a non-conflict zone, it has to do with discrimination, marginalization, a quest for significance, uh, maybe falling in love, wanting to go on an adventure, looking for a better life. Uh, believing nowadays the ISIS dream of an uh, alternative world governance, that there, you can find justice and dignity in a different system, and maybe wanting to escape your problems. So we know that ISIS uh, has come up at the right time uh, to use social media. They've managed to attract, the last number I heard was 48,000 foreign fighters and uh, from 100 different countries. They did that by throwing their propaganda out and uh, watching who tweets. Did you retweet? Did you like me on Facebook? Well, then I can contact you. Do you, do you need something in your life? Can I offer it to you? Um, if you retweeted, can I uh, find something to uh, draw you in, seduce you uh, farther along the terrorist trajectory? So to fight back against ISIS's online and face-to-face -face recruitment, we decided in the last year and a half to try to get ISIS interviews on video. And we managed to do it. We have 62 interviews to date. And the videos that we get are people, for the most part, that, have, that are willing to denounce ISIS, to say that it's un-Islamic, corrupt, uh, that they don't agree with it, that their brutality has gone way too far, and uh, don't join. So our interviews are about what did you like about ISIS? Why did you join? What were your motivations? So that the viewers can understand who is this person? They're like me. Uh, what put them on the terrorist trajectory? What were their experiences inside ISIS? Why did they leave? How did they leave? Um, some of them are prisoners, so they were imprisoned. What do they think of ISIS now? What's their advice for foreign fighters? What's their <coughs> advice for their own people if they're Syrian and, and Iraqis? And we're very proud to say that Facebook has partnered with us recently, so we're going to start an internet campaign with Facebook. But we take these videos, and I'm going to show you two of them in just a second. And uh, we train police. So imagine you're in a, a tough neighborhood, and people are downloading a lot of ISIS videos you can have a counter-narrative on your phone and say, show me yours, I'll show you mine, and maybe uh, cause them to think a bit. Uh, we're putting them out to teachers so that they can possibly inoculate students to think ahead of time, uh, to have some critical thinking skills when it comes to uh, groups like ISIS. We put them out for CVE workers, prison officials. We were just in Iraq taking interviews, and we interviewed an ISIS Samir, and at some point, I said, wait a second, would you be willing to view two little clips I have of ISIS guys on my computer that these guys don't agree with you? What do you think? <laughs> totally took him out. So we know that these work for uh, rehabilitation purposes. Um, we also make them available to anybody that fights ISIS. They're on our YouTube channel, that's ICSVE. And if you want to know more about our work, you can sign up on our website. But um, I think I'll start with the videos because my time is short. So if you'd show the Cubs of the Caliphate, it, this is a 15-year-old that was 13 <coughs> when he joined ISIS. He went into the Cubs of the Caliphate, and this is what he has to say about ISIS. <laughs> درسنا انه كتاب يعلمنا منو ربك ومنو رسولك وشنو دينك المعسكر ظلينا فيه بس شهر لا عسكري لا حنية ولا شي تدريب صعب وضرب سلاح ولا ينسى حاله ووقت انه شايل سلاح الحقيقي يحط يده على الكبسة يحط الخرطوم بصبعه يطعجه هيج شوية لا يكسره مو اكثر من الكبار اصغار بيهم ما جو بالبيكام وخذوا قالوا له اليوم الغصاص عليك انت بدك تقص الكافر المرتد ركب بالبيكام وراح خذ الزرقاوية معه وصل غادي ما جا ما مربط هو من دينه قابه من شعره حط سكين على راسه وبلش يسوي له هيك لمن ما قص راسه بيعان تنزعج بقلبها بس ما جار بسولفة لي فرح لي فرح بما يقصب عنهم كلهم بدون يفرحون يصيحون الله أكبر بس ينزعج ما يجار بيقول ينزعج أو منهم أو يقولون ما يصير تعاقب 
انزل بل ما يحطون بالقفص يجي خمسة ستة يسكرون عليهم القفص ينزلون القفص بل ما يبون ما يقربون يفتصون ويطالعونهم يظلون يحذبونهم هيك ما حد يعرف شنو ذنبهم او شنو هم ويحطون الناس بالسيارة ويضربونها بالقاذف شفت قمت اعرف انه يدربون عجين صغار ما يعرفون كل شيء ولو العجين صغار رجع يروحون على التفجير يعرفون التفجير ما يروحون قمت اشوفهم يدربون عجين على التفجير قلت نهارين او ثلاث يدربون يعني زاد ابطل خير ما يدربون عارف انه معسكرنا راحوا من الكبار والصغار حوالي 15 على التفجير ما كلها تقول لا حد دخل الجنه قاموا يجون قديمين علينا نتعرف عليهم عندهم هواتف شوفون على الانترنت انه عالم جاء تقول تفجير حرام جاء تموت عالم ما لها شغل ولازم يموتون ما جاء يجيهم شيء ومن هذا حكي نسمع عالم ما لها شغل من الذبحة وصغار كبار خسرت وطن كل شيء أقول لكل طفل بالعالم بدي أقول لهم لا تنضمون للتنظيم هذا تنظيم هذا مو مو مسلم ها كفار يذبحون الأبرياء وكل شي يسوونه ومو جايين مشان الجهاد جايين بس مشان المصاري ولي نضم لهم ما يقدر يقشرون بسهولة ويسوون حالهم مسلمين يدربون العالم على التفجير ويقولوا تدخل على الجنة وهذا كله كذب ما بي شيء منه صحيح وحاول اقنعهم انه ما ينضمون مع الدولة. So we have uh, one more I'd like to show you and I'll just tell you that it starts with Allah Akbar because we're trying to on the internet make them look like ISIS uh, videos so that consumers of ISIS videos might consume ours. And I can tell you more about that, but I don't have time. So play the second one, and thank you. أمور يعني أول ما إيجو تحسها طيبة جدا جدا تحس إنه فعلا إسلام قلنا نروح على الجامع هي يعني مسويات يجي شرعي يا يعطي إنسان يعني درس قرآنية كذا هاي كان هو يخطب او يعطي درس للعالم هيك يعني انصحهم انه على الدوله الاسلاميه وكذا او الدوله على حق وما تظلم وكذا وتاخذ وتعيش يعني تاخذ راتب وتعيش بيه نصحني انه اصير بالدوله يوم فرزونا انا قال لي انت امي يعني حطوني حرس للحسبه باليوم يجيبون يعني شي 100 شخص هذا رجال يا دخان يا اما مثلا تكون مرته مو منقبه زاد يجيبونه فوتونهم جوا على جلد وقتل نهارين ثلاثه يعيقونهم نهارين ثلاثه يعيقونهم السجن بي تقريبا 475 سبايا يزيديات بي من العراق بي بعضهم يقاتلون مثلا مع الجيش العراقي جوازهن ياخذونهن بي من سوريا نفس العملية. خيو يوم فتنا على الكوريدور انا انصدمت يعني ضحك كله نساء. قسم اليزيديات والله مرة نسوان يبكين. ليش تبكي انت؟ تقول لي عفت ولدي صغار يعني عمره شي سنة سنتين وجابوني ليه جاي؟ هذا اسلامكم انتم؟ يقول تقول لي. كان اقول لا حول ولا قوة وحطيت بارتي على كتفي وكان اطلع اوقف على الباب يعني ما كملت في الجو. هذول اليوم جاءهم خبر انه جاء امر تسليمكم سبايا بالكوريدور اسمع اصوات وكذا وفرحانين يعني الفرحه قام العسكري يجيب كل عشر مهاجرين طبعا من كثرهم ما يصير دفعه واحده يفوتون على السجن لا تمام يصير يجيب كل عشره يفوتون 
احنا نكون برا على الباب فوتون على الكريدور يختارون ينقون السبيه كل من يختار سبيته تلهم من ايده وتطلع وعلى ظل ثلاث ايام على هالمكوك هذا كل واحد يتف واحده من ايدها وتطلع نصحنا قال اي كلمه تطلع لبرا تكليفه راسك ينقطع انا اولا نفسي جدت المساجين انه حاطين بمخهن الناس النساء جمال كافتهن انه انت راح يذبحن انت كفار انت ما عاد شيء من الاسلام انت نعذبح يعني تا يوم تصير شغله السبايا تهون عليه انه احسن انه تفكر انه ايش من الذبح طبعا شوفها قاعده بالزاويه ذاله نفسها مطي راسها بالارض عينها ما طلع لفوق وعينها بالارض دمعتها بعينها وظل هيك تنام حتى نوم ما تنام يعني نظامي تلقاها بالزاويه عامله هيك ونايمه يوم نشوف المنظر هذا مشتهي تقتلهم كلهم بس حسبنا الله ونعم قبل ما انشق صارت معي حتى انه فات هذا السوداني اختار واحدة عمرها 15 سنة والله اغتصبها صار معها نزيف وجابوا سيارة اسعاف واخذوها صار معها نزيف داخلي وتوفيت هاي طلعوها برا وقالوا ما حد يتكلم شيء خالص السبايا سبايا واعملوا ما يحلو لكم فيه يعني ما نقدر نسولف شيء خالص وفكرت بالانشقاق يعني عاد انا بلشت افكر انه انشق يعني اي انا خيو طلبت اجازه انه اروح ثلاث ايام على البيت ارتاح بعد ما ضليت اسبوع نزلت على البيت حسيت حالي تعبان ماني مرتاح مالي نفس اكل يعني الواحد يعتبر انه خواته يعني ليش كذان يصير ارجع على مكتوب النهار الثاني نزلت انا على البيت يسالوني خواتي ومرتي انه شو قصتك يعني انت كانه بشي ما تتحكي يعني وكذا حكيت لهم القصه كلها انه هيك وهيك صار وصار قالوا لي باسرع وقت لازم نطلع على تركيا لانه اذا صار شيء عليك انت ممكن نروح احنا زاد يعني مو بس هذا اخواتنا راح كل فتره احلم انه معرتين راسي يذبحونه بس سكين وفز من النوم هاي قام يصير معي لا والله إذا أفكر لأنه ما يروح الكاوبوس هذا ما يروح بدي يضل بالذهن يعني ما يروح إذا فكر بي يتعقد وأنا أحاول أنسى يعني كابوس ما ينسى يعني شوف تتذكر إنه المرة شنو قاعدة بالزاوية دمعتها بعينها وما تقدر تعملها شيء أو كذا ما تقدر تنسى أنصح كل شباب العرب إنه لا يجون على سوريا اللي بده يجي على الدولة الإسلامية يحط بباله اغتصاب وقتل وقتل الفقراء قتل المساكين ترى ظلم وظلم واذا تفكر بس تجي وتفكر تريد ترجع راح يقتلونك يعني ما بمفك بس فتت بالرمال اعتبرها رمال متحركة بس فتت غصت ما هي دولة اسلامية هذا الاحشي يعني Great well thank you thank you Anne for those, those two videos and the very very informative uh, presentation as well. What I like about Anne's work is um, that it really gets to the heart of, of one of the key questions in counter extremism, which is how can we find a communications response to insurgent asymmetric communications led by, led by extremists? Um, are we always going to be one step behind as long as this is you know, run, with, run by state actors and run by very often 19th century bureaucracies, you know, are we going to be a little bit held back? Um, can we replicate some of the models that, that extremists use um, to, to great effect? And, and if so, how? Um, and can we reach that target audience as effectively as, as violent extremists do? Um, I think some, these are some of the key questions, and, and I really like how um, Anne tries to, to mirror some of the production values and, uh, uh, in, in, her, in her content. Um, and, and it reminds me, actually, of um, something that, that Michael Lumpkin, the former director of the Global Engagement Center, said uh, when he revealed that uh, the, the entire budget of his department at that time was, was less than 5% of, of the cost of one drone strike. And, and it made me think, well, you know, maybe we can engage civil society a little better to, um, to, to tackle extremist communications in, in this way. 
Now, an organization that, that I think we'd all agree is, is one of the success stories of, uh, of the last decade, certainly of the last five years, of, of countering violent extremism is Hadaya um, in, in the United Arab Emirates. And, a, and a, a really good example, I think, of a multilateral partnership between um, some different countries and, and some of the different stakeholders in the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Um, and that's why I, I'm excited to be able to, to introduce His Excellency Maksud Kruse, who um, is going to be speaking a little bit about his center's work, uh, which, uh, as I said, is, is, is really world-leading. So please. Thank you very much, uh, John. It's a great honor to be here with you in Riga in Latvia. And I have to say, this is my first ever visit to this beautiful country, so I thank you for making this a possibility. I also need to thank the NATO Center of Excellence on Strategic Communications for hosting this dialogue and for making this an exceptional event and very important one. But before I begin my, uh, like I said, in, like I read in some of the tweet feeds, death by presentation and PowerPoint, I have a confession to make to everyone. I do have a serious problem with the issue of counter-narrative, counter-messaging, counter-ideology, counter-anything because it always puts you on the defense. You're always responding to an initiation by someone else. When I usually dream, and I dream a lot, of the ideal world of counter-narrative, how we deal with these extremist groups, the way I always see it, that we need to basically formulate the message. We set the stage. We decide on the tone, and then let them counter our messaging. Let them be on the defense side, not the other way around. We all have seen the usual scenario, a clip that's being produced and then broadcasted, and then officials would say, well, we want to review the authenticity of this clip. Five years later, well, it is authentic indeed. Of course, the effect, the damage has been done. And that's exactly where we need to move forward in a different direction. Hence, trying to talk about alternative messaging, alternative narrative, where we present what is it that we want really from these people. And to be very frank with you, if I look in the eyes of any violent extremist, if I ask them this direct question, ask them, I don't want you to be a violent extremist. Their immediate response would be, so what do you want me to be? What is the alternative? At the moment, they have a sense of identity. They have a sense of purpose. They belong to a greater ideal, a greater idea, where they feel they're making difference to the world that they're seeing, to the perceived injustices, perceived grievances. Therefore, what we need to present to them is what is it that we want from them and how we can help them to move forward in this direction. We at Hedaya, the International Center of Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism, we're able to tackle this dimension, this angle, by presenting different approaches, somewhat innovative, somewhat different, where we basically try to say, this is maybe the way we need to move forward. And I'm happy to share with you some of these examples as well. But just to begin with a bit of brief on our work on counter-narrative, counter-messaging, which basically is one of our main six themes and pillars for the next three years of our own strategic plan. We started basically back in December 2012, where Hedaya officially started, and this was the beginning where we were able to work on how we can support victims of terrorism and hearing their voices, using their narrative to communicate effectively. If someone would see a mother who lost her child, a mother of a victim and a mother of a perpetrator, and both of them were kept in the dark when the incident happened, what kind of difference, what kind of effect would that actually have? But then we moved more dramatically back in December 2014 when we hosted the first ever expo on countering violent extremism communications. Basically, we asked ourselves, what kind of alternative that we want now that we see the rise of Daesh online messaging, which is really unbelievable and unprecedented, how can we counter their online messaging? One of the main initiatives that we had is basically what we call CVE Hackathon. And a hackathon is a bizarre word that has two combinations, hacking and marathon, where you bring experts 
of communication, CVE, practitioners, and also researchers working together to generate certain solution-based, solution-driven approaches to how best deal with the messages of these groups. At the same time, looking at the whole concept of messaging and communication, what type of ideas we can generate, what kind of thoughts we can deliver in this regard. We started conducting series of capacity building workshops and training related to the role of communications, social media, in terms of how we can develop these alternative messages, what kind of approaches we can take, and what it means for us in the long run. And more recently, in 2016, we were able to go a little bit one step further in the direction where we developed the first ever catalog counter-narrative that helps you take certain steps on how to build your counter violent extremism, basically looking at the narratives in Southeast Asia and provide you with a guide that will help you to move forward with this and how far we can go in terms of not just basically analyzing the material that is available online, but actually mapping your own messaging, designing your own messaging, and then implementing in the right direction. Also, we've been working on multiple projects related to journalism and how you can deal with that from a CVE perspective, but also amplifying the voices of the female defectors as well as mapping the experiences of the different perpetrators, whether male, female. And it's worth noting that we at Hedaya, we focus on all forms of extremism, whether right-wing white supremacy, left-wing anarchy, or even the usual suspects that we deal with, all forms of extremism, we believe, begins as an idea. And it's this idea that triggers a certain emotional response which leads to the act, the behavior of violent extremism. To give you a bit of our activities overview, you will see that the focus on our communications and counter-narrative, although it's one of six themes, it actually occupies 17% of most of our activities, whether it's research, capacity building, or dialogue initiatives. At the same time, we developed online resources, which I all invite you to basically join and participate and take advantage of, which is our own virtual counter-narrative library, in which we basically assembled a collection from around the world, from the different innovations, different ideas, different approaches, and looking at examples, case studies, how you can actually deal with this. Whether you're looking for a clip that you want to watch, or basically specific tweet feeds or campaigns that you want to build, or simple analyses and research-based type of material, all of this is available at your disposal. At the same time, we understand that we need to look at a diversification of the different approaches to countering narrative and be able to provide you with all the different material that we produce as Hedaya, especially the Southeast Asia collection, the guides that we've developed, in order for you to be able to look at it. At the same time, we try to produce some of these guides in multiple languages, local languages of the different parts of Southeast Asia, and also be able to allow it to be accessible to both the practitioners on the ground, in the field, but also the policymakers, those who need to strategize and need to plan ahead. At the same time, when we look at the recent activity of the mapping experience of formers, basically, we asked ourselves a very simple question. If I would meet with a former violent extremist, there are two central questions that I need to ask to understand the processes, the underpinnings, why someone becomes violent extremist. The first question, how did you become violent extremist in the first place? What led you into that? What kind of narrative? What kind of messaging? And then the second question, how did you snap out of it? What made you wake up one day and realize that this was a mistake and basically you need to move on with your life and maybe join us in countering these messages. And going through these processes allowed us to basically look at this and understand and learn. And this is basically one of our latest publications which is available online, which you can access and basically use and learn from, but also help us to expand on our own existing knowledge and understanding. Related to that as well, is we wanted to amplify the voice of female defectors. You'll notice at Hedaya, one of our projects that we constantly work on since the last two, three years is highlighting the role of women in particular when it comes to countering violent extremism. We've noticed throughout 2016 and the different incidences that took place in Europe that there's always a female in female perpetrator involved in this, either basically committing the act of terrorism or harvesting or inspiring. 
Therefore, how to be able to lead on this and what kind of difference we can make in this regard, that is also part of the different campaigns, the different work, and the different initiatives in this regard. At the same time, we looked at journalism, the day-to-day -day news feed. What relevance does it have in this whole process of countering communication? Who actually is working on it? What it actually means? These are some of the events that we're going to do during this year, which is an open invitation, and please do follow us and be able to contribute to that. And also, there is one recent event that we'll be doing very soon in Marrakesh, where also focuses on the issue of counter-narrative and how to build the capacity, the momentum, and the different models and thinking in this regard. One of our few publications that I've put here, which you can access fully on our website, related on the different aspects of the examples I provided. Whether we're talking about the guide on how to build your own counter-narrative, or basically how to expand your own research, that is evidence-based, provide the knowledge in which you can build your own narrative, or basically looking at the role of females and how women can actually play a role, but an extended role also of families, and basically how we can all be part of the solution. In addition to our publications, we have multiple resources. As many of you are aware, Hedaya was the first inspired initiative by the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which is a multilateral organization with 29 countries plus the EU, and 12 of them are members of our steering board. Basically, we work very closely with the GCTF in developing certain good practices, but also moving forward with providing certain policy-level guidelines, which will help you in your strategic planning and understanding as well. With that, I would like to conclude by a very simple thought. I have my very beautiful daughter, my little princess, Eliazia. When I'm negotiating with her at night, she needs to go sleep, but she wants to watch the TV. Basically, what you have to do, not telling her, well, you should actually not stay late. You should not be doing this. In fact, and as we've learned from psychology, and we're in the presence of wonderful psychologists, and I'm one of them personally, guilty as charged, you basically ask her, ask your children, what is it that you want them to do? Basically reinforcing the behavior that you want from them. So back to my initial question earlier this presentation, it's not about that we don't want these Vaughan extremists to continue to be Vaughan extremists, but basically what is it that we want from them? And I hope that we all together can find the answer for this question. Thank you very much.